Okay. All right, where I think we'll get ourselves going. Um, welcome to our trout dissection live live not a live trout with jennifer jackson of the idaho fishing game um, we are live on facebook as well and we welcome questions at any time you can use the q a um, question in zoom or just go ahead and put those in the comments on facebook and i will get those to jennifer and we are also recording so um, this will be available on our youtube page later this afternoon so i'm going to let jennifer take it away all right, uh, welcome and thanks for joining us today. Again, I'm Jennifer Jackson with the Idaho Department of Fish and Game here in the Southeast region of the state. And I'm really excited to be joining my fishy friends over here at the Idaho Museum of Natural History at ISU. It's really great that they're able to keep the Trout in the Classroom program going this, um, this spring and this summer. We have 17 classrooms here in the Southeast region and with everyone having to work from home and school from home online, those Trout in the Classroom programs had to finish early. And so it's great that students can check back in and see how another Trout Tank is doing. And that's, that's been great for us as well. Um, I want to do a real sh big shout out to the folks here at the museum as well as our wonderful teachers that are so passionate about this amazing program. And I've got to send a shout out, a, a big add of fish to our sponsors here in um, Pocatello. So we have the Southeast Idaho Fly Fishers. We have um, the Petco store in Chubbuck. They have been tremendous in providing uh, money, time, personnel, uh, hard work, uh, dedication, bodies, whatever we've needed to get our program going. It's allowed us to stretch our dollars that we get further so we can grow this program to where it is today. So thanks to them and also thanks to Trout Unlimited because they've done a great job as well supporting our program here in the region. So with that, why don't we dive in and take a look at Trout and we're gonna get it, do an investigation literally from the outside in. So I will have the camera adjusted here so we can start with our trout. And I think that looks really good right there. So hopefully you can see this trout. We are working with a rainbow trout from the American Falls Fish Hatchery um, in American Falls. They raise 380,000 of these guys every year. And so they were able to give me just a couple so we could do this education program today. It's called a rainbow trout, and it's hard to see, I know, especially since this fish is no longer alive. It's lost some of its coloring. But rainbow trout actually has a pink stripe that runs along the side of their body, and that's why they get that name of rainbow trout. So when you first see a trout or any fish, if you've ever held one, you'll note that they're kind of slimy. And that slimy coat is actually called a slime coat, and it has a really important purpose. It's what keeps the fish um, from getting a, too many diseases or parasites or other problems, funguses and that sort of thing while they're swimming around in their environment. So the slime coat's really important. In fact, if you're ever catching fish and you want to hold one, especially if you're going to release it, make sure that your hands are wet before you handle a fish because you don't want to pull the slime coat off with your dry hands because that won't be very good for the fish when you release it. Um, this is another reason uh, or another feature that trout have is they have this streamlined body. So if you see he's kind of shaped like a torpedo and some fish are rounder like a bluegill or even a bass might be a little bit rounder, a crappie is a little bit rounder. These guys are designed for swimming in strong currents in a river or a stream or a creek. But don't get me wrong, they're really good at being fat and sassy at the bottom of a pond too, but they are designed for, for current swimming. And that's important if you're a steelhead or a sockeye salmon and you've got to swim all the way to the ocean and live out there for a while before you come back upstream to where you were hatched. It's got, you've got to be able to be strong and streamlined to, to, to swim through that current. Uh, other features of, of fish is that they do have um, besides, besides living in the water, um, and they do have fins to help them live in the water. So they have the fins that you see here on the body. Um, they have skeletons. So they actually do have a backbone. 
um, that allows them to give structure and support. And the fins on this fish do have a purpose. So the tail fin here, or the caudal fin, is what helps push the fish through the water. Then they have these fins on the top. The top part of the fish is called the dorsal side. So these are the dorsal fins. And underneath, the bottom side is called the ventral. And these are the, and these are the ventral fins, and they do have a purpose. So the dorsal fins and the ventral fins will help balance the fish in the water. So when they're swimming, they don't tip over on the side, they can stay upright. Again, the tail fin pushes and the muscles of the fish push the fish through the water. They have pectoral fins down here that help them uh, change direction. So if they wanna turn, turn sharply, they can. Um, and in some fish, if I th think about bluegill, for example, their dorsal fin, their main one, has a lot of spikes in it. If you've ever held it, they've held it or seen those fish, they have little spines or spikes, and that can make it hard to grab the fish, and that's by design. This also makes it hard for predators to get in on and try to grab the fish. These guys don't have super spiny dorsal fins, so uh, they're not as, as pokey as maybe you'd see on a bluegill. Okay, so those are the fins. Oh, I can't forget this fin. This little fin right here before the caudal fin, it might be kind of hard to see. That little fin right there is called the adipose fin. So salmon and trout and char have this little adipose fin. Um, and, and they're really not sure what the function of that fin is other than some speculate it may be to help water, direct water or current over the body to make it more streamlined, but, but people really aren't sure what that that fin is for. Okay, now let's look at the other parts of the fish. You can see that fish have eyes. Do you see how big those pupils are on those eyes? That allows to let in quite a bit of light. So when you're underwater, it's kind of dark under there, depending on how, how far down you are. They also have, oh, and they don't have eyelids. So like we get to blink with our eyes. We get to keep our eyes moist when we close our eyes. These guys don't have eyelids that they shut. Their eyes are open all the time. Of course, a fish has a mouth, right? That's how they're gonna take in water. That's very important because that's where the oxygen is that they need to breathe. So we take in oxygen through the air and it goes into our lungs before it goes to our bloodstream. These guys take it in through water, through their mouth, and then it goes over their gills. And I'm gonna lift that gill up, and I think you can see how red that is under there. That shows all the blood vessels, the capillaries, that are in the gills. That's really important because that blood will carry the oxygen to the rest of the fish. And so what happens is that water goes over the gills and the oxygen comes out of the water into the gills and into the bloodstream of the fish. And to help protect those gills, there's this little gill cover right here and it has a fancy name. It's called an operculum, but we can just call it a gill cover. Uh, the mouth is also used to grab food. So this trout right here, this size, loves to eat insects and he might even eat a juicy worm on the end of your hook if you're going fishing. So they have a mouth to be open, and if you feel the inside, you'll just kind of have to trust me on this because you probably can't see it. They're teeny tiny little teeth, and that's what helps them uh, grab onto the prey and to hold it. These guys, fit, uh, fish in general, have tongues too. And again, the tongue is rough, and that tongue helps hold the prey that they bring into their mouth, whether it's an insect or maybe even if it's a smaller fish, they've got to be able to hold on to that and push it to the back of their uh, esophagus. Um, what else do we need to say about your mouth and your tongue? Oh, the ability to taste, that's really important. So these guys do taste their food. And if you've ever been fishing, you may have seen a situation where you're fishing with the worm and the fish swallows the whole worm, swallows the hook clear down into their esophagus. Well, the reason for that is your worm tastes real because it is, and it sure is yummy. And so they're ready to swallow the whole thing. Now, if you fish with artificial lures like flies or lures that have like metal or feathers or fur and that sort of thing, they can taste the, the, those artificial materials. And a lot of times they'll just spit it out. And when they do, that hook will get hooked on the side of their mouth. And that's why it's a little easier to do catch and release with artificial lures um, because they usually don't swallow the whole hook. 
Now, if you do have a situation where they swallow hook and you are worried about releasing your fish, rather than pulling the whole hook out, where you might actually pull out some important parts of this fish or hurt this fish, you can just cut the line right at the mouth and let the fish go. And eventually, just within a matter of days, that hook can rest right out there and be released. You never just want to yank it right out. You want to be careful with your fish if you're practicing catch and release. Of course, if you're keeping the fish to eat, that's great too. Okay, so that's kind of an outside look at our trap. We're going to get ready here in a minute to, to dig in to look on the inside. Uh, actually, before I do that, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about camouflage. You may be able to see that this fish is lighter colored on the bottom and a little darker on the top. That's by design. That's its camouflage. You can also see uh, there's some spotting or spots along here as well. That helps them blend into their environment. So think about this for a minute. You're a trout swimming in a pond or in a lake or in a stream, and there might be a bald eagle above you. Well, that bald eagle's got pretty darn good eyesight. It's going to be harder to see this fish because the dark top is going to blend in with the dark bottom of the pond or the stream. That helps them blend in. Now, if you're a bigger fish looking up at this fish, the light side is going to blend in with the sunlight coming in through the water, and that's going to allow them to blend in with the sunlight coming from above. So that's how their camouflage works. You'll see that some fish um, like crappie or bluegill or even perch will have stripes on the side and that's because sometimes they like to hide in the aquatic plants that are underneath the water and so they can actually look like they're blending into the long leaves or of those and stems of those plants. Okay, so I think that's it for our outside look. Um, of course, fish have scales. Uh, and that's another part of their body that's important. Oh, I see something else. I've got to make sure I show you because this is pretty neat to see. There is a line, a dark line across the, the length of this fish. It is called a lateral line. And it's made up of a bunch of little canals that go inside the fish's body. So it's right here. If you ever see a fish up close, you'll see that line. That helps them detect um, vibrations in the water and pressure changes. That's really important if you're a fish and you're worried about a great blue heron sneaking up on you or maybe a fisherman that's waiting in the water. You're going to feel those vibrations in the water and will know that something's coming uh, down the stream or down, down the water, maybe to eat you. So it helps them feel those vibrations uh, to have that lateral line there as well. Also, and I can't forget this part, they have nostrils or little nares. They do have great senses of smell. In fact, fish can smell their food, they can smell chemicals in the water, and their home smells very unique to them. So if they leave their area, leave their home, especially those fish that are anadromous or spend some time living in a freshwater environment and then swimming out to an ocean environment and then coming back to a freshwater environment, those fish have to be able to find their way home, and they do that by smelling their way home to where they started and where they're hatched. That's where they return to have the, to lay their eggs, and that's where they will spend their last days before they, they die. Not all fish are anadromous, so some fish that live in a pond or a stream will live there their whole life, but it's still important that they have a good sense of smell. All right, so are we ready to see what the inside of the fish looks like? Jennifer, yes. before we move on, we do have one question about the outside of the body. I um, love to hear it. How do fish see when water is rushing in past their eyes? So they have a very thick cornea. So it's, the, it's the covering of their eye. It's thicker than ours. And it protects their eye. They also have a, they have a special eye, they have a lens that's inside their eye, and we're gonna look at that lens a little bit later. That helps them really take in light and they're able to see. Um, they can't focus with that lens like we can, uh, but they can still see well with their eyes. So they do really well in an environment, even with the water rushing by. And again, because that pupil is so large, they can take in light with that eye, which allows them to see even in water that might seem a little dark. But if they can't see, that's okay because they have a nose that helps them sense their environment, smell their environment. They have that lateral line that's gonna help them. 
And some fish even have extra things like catfish that have barbels uh, hanging off of their face. It helps them detect and sense their environment. So they do really well in their environment with those adaptations. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and look inside this fish. And I may have to cut this back so you can see it better, but I wanted to at least pull this part out and see if you can see the air black. And that's, that is a part of the fish, kind of shiny. It looks like a little balloon that's been inflated with air and that's because that's exactly what's happened. This fish has taken in air and filled their air bladder. Okay, now watch what happens when I take this um, probe. Hopefully you can see that shiny air bladder right there. Watch what happens when I poke it. Wow, it's hard to poke. I might have to do it with the other end. Oh, there we go. Okay, I put a hole in it. And just like you would expect with the balloon, the air came out. So what is the purpose of the swim bladder or the air bladder? Well, when fish are swimming, it's, you know, if you think about when you jump into a swimming pool, you have to tread water with your arms and legs to kind of stay afloat. Even if you're floating on your back, you might have to kick your feet a little bit to stay on top of the water. The air bladder helps these guys stay suspended in the water. It keeps them buoyant so that they can just stay right in the water column without a lot of work. They don't have to do a lot of swimming to stay up or down in the water column. And that's, that air bladder helps them just stay afloat within that water column, if that makes sense. Now, it's kind of a, a funny thing. They can de deflate their air bladder. Obviously, they're not gonna do it with a probe like I just did but they can actually get that air out of their air bladder. It's kind of like a bird. And I know that sounds silly, but they let the air out through their mouth and then they can take in more air to fill their air bladder later when, if they need to adjust to that. Okay, so we lost some of the parts of this fish when I was lifting it up. I'm just gonna turn this around for just one second. I wanna make sure that I can pull the air bladder back because I wanna show you what's hiding behind the air bladder. And I wanna make sure I can get that out of the way so you can see it. Cause we're gonna look at all these parts of the fish. You know, it's really important to, to do dissections like this because it helps us understand what makes a fish function. So we understand what, you know, what their needs are as they live in their environment. And it also teaches us a lot about ourselves because we have a lot of the same features in our bodies. They might look a little different, but they have the same or similar functions. Plus, this might get you excited about science or maybe becoming a doctor if you do dissections like this. So it's always good to kind of grow your mind and investigate. That's what's great about science. Okay, so right here at the top, I don't know if you can see this, but there's a few little bones sticking out. That's because fish have skeletons. So there's a little few bones here. And then right here is some flesh. This would be the part of the fish that you would eat if you were to eat this fish. We did a fish fillet, it comes from this part right here. That's the muscle and there's some fat in there as well. Okay, this dark line right here behind that air bladder, okay, that dark line that runs up along the back of this fish, the full length of the fish is the kidney. So it looks very different than our kidneys. We have two kidneys, one on kind of each side of our back here, but they have a long kidney here. And that's really important for filtering the blood, keeping it clean and pulling the waste out of the blood. Uh, it's, um, they also can produce some blood cells with their kidney, which is kind of unique with fish. Another feature that they have while we're talking about blood is the, the um, spleen. The spleen is where they produce blood. And that is right here, this, this dark organ right there is the spleen, if you can see that. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, the other features you see here. This large part here, oh, I just got hooked on it, is the stomach. Okay, so they have a stomach, and I will see if this will work here. If we put our probe here in the mouth, let's say this was a bug going to this, this fish, it's gonna go into the esophagus, and it's gonna go right into the stomach. And it's probably a little hard to see that, but I'm actually sticking it into the esophagus and, and that's me wiggling my probe right there. 
And that would be where the insect would go, and then it goes right into the stomach to be digested. And right here, this stuff is called the pyloric cica, which is kind of a fancy name, but it also helps with digestion. It helps the stomach absorb nutrients, or the fish absorb nutrients, proteins, sugars, and that sort of thing out of the food they get so that they can be healthy. So this is the stomach. Uh, this is the esophagus where I've inserted my pro, and sitting right on top of this, this red structure right here is the liver. And the liver is really important because it produces bile and that bile helps digest fat. So all of this right here is helping digest the food that the fish takes in. Now, it's gonna go out of the stomach into the intestine. You have intestines too in your body. This right here is the intestine. This structure right here and that intestine will do the last bit of digestion grabbing the last bit of nutrients before the stuff the fish can't use is expelled out their vent or their um, cloaca so i will see if i can show this to you here on this fish but see this little opening right here i don't know if you can see that there's a little opening that opening right there is where the waste from a fish comes out. If this was a female fish, this was also where her eggs would come out when she's laying her eggs. And so when, it, when an opening is good for both waste and for laying eggs, we call that a cloaca, which is another fancy name. Um, so basically that's where their poop comes out. And yes, everyone poops. That's one of my favorite books. If you haven't read it, you gotta read it. It talks about wildlife. That's why I like it. And it talks about a funny subject too, which is kind of fun. Okay, so um, it goes out the intestine, the food that's being digested, and then the little bit of waste that's left is expelled or sent out through the vent or the cloaca. Okay, now let's look at where the heart is. So I'm gonna pull this back, and I might have to take a minute and cut this off if you can't see it. So I'm gonna turn it around for just a second and see if I can find the heart. Oh yeah, there it is, okay. Okay, so that little red structure right next to my thumb, not the liver, that's the liver right there, but this little tiny red structure right there, that is the heart. And if you notice, it's really close to the gills, right? Let's think about that for just a minute. The gills are important for getting the oxygen out of the water and into the bloodstream. Well, what a better place for a heart than right next to the gills because it's the pump for the blood. So it can take that, all that oxygen right there and then pump that fresh oxygen to the rest of the body. And that is a good design. That's a good adaptation for that fish to have, is to have its heart right next to the gills. So hopefully you can see that. Jennifer, we have a question about the heart. Great. How can a tiny heart support such a big body? Well, that's, that's a good question. You know, the heart is a muscle, and if, they, if they're it fit, it's going to do a good job for them. It's gonna be a good pump, and it's going to just get that blood going through their body. So if you think about your own body and how big you are gonna get, your heart is pretty small for the size of your body. And that's why it's really important to take good care of your heart and make sure that you, put, you take in good food and you don't put substances in your body that can hurt your heart because it's got an important job, doesn't it? So uh, they just, they're very efficient and just it's a good strong muscle and it pumps to do its job for this fish. I think that's another good view of it there. But that was a good question. Okay, so um, we may want to actually maybe cut the stomach uh, open because it's kind of fun to see what fish have been eating. So if you can bear with me for just a minute, I'm gonna pull the stomach out um, and then we can see what's inside. So sometimes if you're catching fish that have been living out in the wild, you'll, you'll, you'll see that they've been eating bugs and you can see what kind of bugs they've been eating, which is really interesting. 
whether you're a fisherman or whether you're a scientist, it's just kind of fun to see what they've been eating. Now, these fish have been at a hatchery. So I'm gonna, in fact, I'm gonna show you what their fish food looks like, because they have some here at the museum. Sorry, I know this is messy, but sometimes the sections get messy. So, um, so that's the stomach. And let's look to see if we can tell what it's been eating. So all that you see right there is the food that's been digesting in their body. So he had a stomach full of food, didn't he? A nice, big, full stomach. And then the, they're going to take that, those stomach contents, all the nutrients, the sugars, the proteins, are going to be absorbed into the body of the fish, into the, into the bloodstream, so it can be healthy and grow fat and, and stay healthy. And then the waste is going to be pushed out the intestine and out the body. This is what fish food looks like at the hatcheries. See if I can open this up for you. My hands are a little slick. So it almost looks like crushed Oreos. And I have a funny story about that. There's a trout in the classroom teacher that had some young students in her classroom who had their little brother or little sister with them and they thought it was crushed cookies and they put a handful in their mouth. But it wasn't crushed Oreos, it was uh, fish food. And the fish love it, but of course we wouldn't when it tastes very good to us. So that's what he's been eating. But where he, when he goes out, when fish like that get out, released out to the wild, they'll be able to eat a whole bunch of bugs and other things, snails and you know, insects, things like that, that are gonna get them uh, fat and sassy as they grow. Okay, now I'm gonna move this fish for just a minute. So I have something really interesting I wanted to show you and hopefully it will show up on camera. If not, I'm sure there's a video out there where you can see this better. But this is an eyeball from the fish. And this eyeball, I, I pulled it out of the, the, the fish's head, of course. Um, it's kind of, kind of soft. And it has a lens on the inside of it that's perfectly round. And I'm hoping that I can pull that lens out and show it to you. It may not show up, but it's kind of interesting to see. So I had done this a little earlier. Um, and let's see if I can get that lens to show up. Hopefully it will. If not, I know, oh, there it is, but it's kind of red. Okay. Oh, there, I'm popping it out right now. I'm going to put it on this piece of paper and then I'm going to hold it up to see if you guys can see it. Okay, so bear with me. So I'm getting that going there. Okay. Okay, so that right there, hopefully you can see that little round spot. That's a lens, and it's actually kind of hard to the touch. It's not soft. It's, it's, it's covered in a soft um, liquid, but the lens itself is actually hard. And that's what they're using to take in that information um, that, um, that they're seeing, and that lens kind of works like a lens in a camera or a lens in your eye or a, a magnifying lens. It just helps them see things better. And it is hard, like I'm it's not super hard, I, but it's, it's just not, it's not uh, squishy either. It's just a nice, it's a, it's a really neat uh, to, to look and hold that. And I wish, this is the one time I wish you could be here with me so you could see and hold that and feel it yourself. I've also seen where people have taken lenses and put it on top of newspaper print, and you can actually see the newspaper print magnify through the lens, but I won't be able to demonstrate that here. But there it is right there again. Let's see that. That's the little lens inside their eyeball. Okay, so that means they must have nerves inside their eye that connect to their brain. They do have a small brain underneath their skull. I don't know if you can hear this, but that is the tapping of their skulls. They do have a skull. Their backbone goes across the back and protects their spinal cord. So they have a spinal cord like we do. They have vertebrae like we do. Those are the little back uh, bones that you feel on your back. And that gives them support and structure. Now there, is a, a, there are a couple of fish that don't have skeletons like these fish. So sharks and sturgeon, and we do have sturgeon here in Idaho. They have cartilage. 
and cartilage is the support or the structure you feel on your in your ears it's not it feels kind of like bone but it's really flexible and that cartilage is what um, some fish have but these guys actually have uh, honest to goodness bone okay some people want to know how fish hear they do not have ears on the outside of their body they have a kind of an internal ear um, and it's there's a, a structure a bone called an, an, an otolith or an otolith and I, I won't be able to do that for you today but you can actually dig around and pull that bone out and look at it and what's interesting is you can even tell the age of the fish by the the otolith because it, it uh, has rings on it just much like a tree ring uh, a tree does with its tree rings and you can tell how old a fish is uh, you can also tell from scales if you could get one of these scales off and put it under a microscope you'd be able to tell how old a fish is by their scales okay so um let me see i'm going to look at my notes to see if i missed anything awesome that i wanted to share with you about trout there's just tons of really cool stuff but i think i covered most of the body parts that i wanted to cover with you today so i'm going to put the screen up and we can take some more questions and while we are taking those questions um, i might tell you a little bit about fish so in the world there are twenty thousand different kinds of fish and here in Idaho, we have about 100 different species or different kinds of fish. And part of the job of Idaho Department of Fish and Game is to manage fish populations. We are in charge of the wildlife that lives here in the state. And, um, and that is kind of our job to make sure that they have healthy habitats, that their populations are doing well, um, and that we can we study them, we do research, we do science so we can learn more about the fish and other wildlife that live in our state. And then another important thing that we do is we make sure that there's plenty of wildlife for those individuals who like to fish and hunt and trap. So our department gets its money from the people that buy fishing and hunting and trapping licenses. We don't get state tax dollars. So we use that money that we get and we put it right back into the resource and that's how we do uh, research projects. It's how we uh, put bitter brush and sagebrush out on the landscape. Let's see if there's been a fire or something like that. We might help with a rehab project on the landscape. We help to do improve waterways and aqu uh, aquatic habitat for fish and, and birds. Um, there's so much that we do to try to help promote populations of wildlife here in the state. And we're, we're concerned about all the wildlife. So it's not just the ones you hunt and fish but we also take care of and, and watch over the wildlife um, that we don't hunt fish like bats and songbirds and frogs and snakes and, and, and other critters like that. It's all, and they're all important and they all have an important role here in Idaho. In fact, fish are not only important to anglers because if you're like me and you love to fish, you like to go out and catch fish and eat them, but fish are also important to other wildlife that rely on them for food. So Bears and eagles, great herons, osprey, and other animals rely on fish as well. So it's important that we have a really diverse wildlife population here in the state, or, or, uh, lots of different species. Um, so it just makes it more fun. Makes it more fun when we go outside and go on hikes. It makes it more fun when we're living in town and we can sit on our back porch and see birds and, and other animals in our backyard. It makes it fun if you like to hunt and fish to go out and pursue those animals and take them home and maybe eat them. And that way you can kind of provide for your family that way too. That's always, that's always a good thing. Um, so there's, there's lots of reasons why uh, wildlife is so important. And, and we're glad that we're part of that mission to, to perpetuate and manage wildlife in this state. Are there any other questions for me? Um, I actually have a question from my daughter, Emma, who's been watching. Wonderful. She wants to know if there are any invasive species of fish that are um, affecting our native fish populations. So it's really interesting, out of that 100 fish species I mentioned we have in the state, um, um, a lot of them maybe uh, are actually introduced species. So they're not, they weren't native. Um, so an example of a native fish here in, in Idaho would be the cutthroat trout. In fact, it's our state fish. Um, you fourth graders could learn about your state symbols and you'll learn about the cutthroat trout. 
Um, but there are other fish that have been introduced, like the brown trout, for example. Um, and so it can be a problem. Um, if you're in an area where there's a, kind of a limited amount of resources, a limited habitat, limited food, water, shelter, space, and you've got a bunch of fish competing for it, that can be a problem, especially for our native fish. Because somebody's going to probably end up out competing with uh, the other fish. So, um, but sometimes they live side by side just fine. And that's why as wildlife managers will come in and we can look at that and we can see, are there areas where we need to move trout out of a, uh, trout or fish out of a particular body of water because they're pro causing problems from native fish? Or are they getting along just fine and there's plenty of resource or habitat for them? So we look at that. Um, so an example of that is here on the South Fork of Snake River in another, in another region. Um, they have a native cutthroat trout living there as well as um, introduced rainbow trout. And some of you might think rainbow trout aren't introduced. They, they live in other parts of Idaho. They've been here forever. That's true, but a long time ago, uh, we introduced them to this side of the state. They couldn't normally get up here because of Shoshone Falls that was blocking their way. And when we did that, we did cause, probably cause a few problems for our cutthroat uh, hatchery or cutthroat fishery there in the South Fork. And so that's why we're working with anglers to try to remove rainbow trout to provide more habitat and uh, so we don't have um, issues with our, our cutthroat trout. Because we want them to also have a place where they can thrive and grow. And so sometimes we can do management tactics or management strategies like that. Um, but we just take it on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and fish are, are really interesting to study. If you've ever want to become a fish biologist, it's a, it would be a fun job to do. And it's fun to work at Fish and Game because it's a job where you get to get outside a lot and you get to see wildlife, you get to see fish, to see birds, mammals, all sorts of critters, and you feel like you're doing something really important. So hopefully that answered the question. Yes, yes she said okay. it did. And then um, someone wanted to know, are bluegill native fish? Um, so I don't, oh, that's a good question. So let me tell you, I don't think that they are, uh, boy, I don't think so. I would have to look that up. So here's what I'm going to do. They've been here a really, 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 really long time. Um, but whether they're truly native, I don't know. They tend to be, I think of bluegill, they're like, they're, oh, this is something I didn't mention. They are what we call like a warm water fish. And trout tend to be a cold water fish. So at the trout in the classroom, you can see the trout tank behind us. They actually have a chiller on this tank that keeps the water at about 52 degrees. Um, trout need cold water. They need it because the oxygen is better in cold water. It's more dissolved and they can have better access to that oxygen. Bluegill, they can do better in warm water. They, they, they don't have the same oxygen requirements. Um, they need oxygen, but, it, but it, if they don't maybe need as much, or they can handle a warmer environment where the oxygen isn't as dissolved. Um, and so that's a good question I'll need to figure out uh, if they were introduced. That's what my gut says, but I don't know how long ago. So I'm going to confirm that, and then we'll make sure we get it on the website for the Idaho Museum of Natural History. But here's a point I want to bring up. If you really love bluegill and you want to go fishing at your favorite pond that has bluegill in it, that's awesome. They're one of my favorite fish to fish for. But don't think you can then grab some of those bluegill and take it to another fish from somewhere else, maybe a little closer home. We never ever want to take fish from one water body to another and dump it in there. That is, um, it's against the law, first of all, but it's not good science and it's not fair to the fish that are living in that pond. Could you imagine if you came home from school one day and found out a whole bunch of people moved into your house and eating all your food and sleeping in your bed? and playing with your toys and whatever else, that would probably not be such a great thing for you. You might be a little frustrated by that. They might even eat all your food. We don't want to do that to other fish that are living in ponds and streams. So don't ever transport fish or move uh, uh, wildlife to another location. If that's going to be done, the biologists at Fishing Game can do that, um, but we don't ever want to have the public do that. And any other doesn't, questions? It doesn't look like we have any other questions. That was really interesting and fun. My uh, my fifth grader, she uh, she wants to go fishing now so that she can uh, 
dissect a fish by herself. <laughs> oh, very good. That's awesome. So there are opportunities to get out there fishing. Remember, if you're 14 years old or older, you will need a fishing license to fish in Idaho. If you're under 14, you don't need a fishing license. Now with the COVID situation going on, our trailer program that we have where we get people out fishing, um, that is temporarily suspended right now. We're hoping to get it up at some point during the summer if conditions allow, but if not, we'll bring it back next summer. So if you've never been fishing before and don't know how to fish or what you want to do, I... Oh no. It looks like we lost her. Um, so we're going to go ahead and end the um, trout in the classroom for today. Thank you everyone for joining. Um, if you do have any questions, feel free to email us at imnh at isu.edu and we will send those on to Jennifer to get those answers. Thank you everyone for joining.